Hey everybody, I'm Tim Mooney with the Timothy Mooney Repertory Theater. So today, I'm doing another crossover episode of I Finally Get, with a discussion of a speech that shows up in two of my one-man plays, both Lot O. Shakespeare and Shakespeare's History's Ten Epic Plays at a Breakneck Pace. I'll be performing Lot O. Shakespeare, which features one monologue randomly chosen from each of Shakespeare's known 38 plays, this coming Sunday and Monday, April 24th and 25th, 2021, with an 8 p.m. performance on Sunday on Facebook.com slash Tim Mooney Rep, and another 8 p.m. performance on Monday on Zoom. The Sunday night performance is a pay-whatever-you-want event, and Monday's Zoom show is just $5. If you're curious, you can go back and explore some of my other takes on famous Shakespeare speeches, such as this one, or you can follow my ongoing series about Shakespeare's histories, leading off with this one about King John. My next video, coming up in a couple of weeks, is going to look at the whole play Henry V, so subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of the upcoming stuff. But for now, I'm going to focus on what is by far the most popular speech in this play, the St. Crispin's Day speech. This one is right up there alongside Friends Roman's Countryman from Julius Caesar. What you need to know, King Henry and his men have had a rough go and are in a tight spot. Following some early success in their righteous campaign in France, capturing the city of Harfleur at the end of a long five-week siege, they left a garrison behind to hold down the fort while a smaller remnant of their army turned eastward, attempting the long march toward Calais, a French port that had remained in English possession in spite of the many losses of French territories dating back to the days of King John over the course of 200 plus years of battle and and rivalry. Marching through most of a cold and rainy October, King Henry finds rough going, losing many of his soldiers to weariness, hunger, and disease. The enormous French army has made its way north, cutting Henry's army off at the Somme River, forcing Henry to turn south away from his intended northeastern path. They finally find a portion of the river where they can cross without making themselves vulnerable to attack and work their way back north as the French give way, continuing to thin out the weary English army. Finally, the French square off on the fields of Agincourt. The estimated 60,000 French outnumber the English 5 to 1 with strong cavalry on their side, while the English army, with very few horses, does feature some powerful archers. This decisive battle will be fought on St. Crispin's Day, October 25th. Just about every day in the calendar was dedicated to one saint or another, and this one is dedicated to two brothers, Crispin and Crispian, the patron saints of shoemakers. Henry moves amongst his men, finding them exhausted, worried, and cynical. Some of them are confident that in the course of this hopeless battle, they will all be killed, while Henry himself will survive in light of his value as a ransomable prisoner. Into this cloud of discouragement, Henry enters to find his cousin Westmoreland sighing, Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. And it is there that Henry goes to work. When I perform this piece as a standalone monologue, I usually drop off the opening six lines, if only to keep the speech short. But it's worth mentioning that Henry opens this great speech with some short sentences that lay out the framework for what will be his argument, that the very fact of their small numbers will pay off greatly down the line with a maximum amount of heroism being spread among a minimum number of fighters, as each soldier will be accorded a greater share of the glory. It's essentially a math problem, and Henry gets his men worked up into a lather simply by giving context to the basic math. Shakespeare uses the word in now in those opening lines, which is a form of the word enough that we don't use anymore, given that Henry is not speaking in rhyming verse and that enough has the same number of syllables, I switch out the word and pretty much no one is the wiser. The last thing I want is for the audience trying to puzzle out the meaning of what should otherwise be a self-evident word and thereby missing the setup to what is a barn burner of a speech. Yes, Shakespeare wrote beautiful poetry, but get your priorities straight. It's a play. Here's that opening. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland. 
No, my fair cousin, if we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Already, it's a little bit inspiring. He's laid out the math problem in this brief prelude, but what you may notice is that these first lines are a little bit fragmented, with four or five sentences over the course of six lines. But here's the biggest thing impacting the structure of the speech, where the sentences end. Find the periods. They are the tiniest marks on the page, but the most important. Sometimes I give weight to question marks and exclamation points, but quite often those marks just leverage us forward into the next important thought. And Henry's opening, halting, short sentences are just a warm-up as he hits his stride in the next sequence. The entire remainder of the speech is made up of seven sentences spread over 44 lines. Do not get seduced by commas, semicolons, colons, question marks, and even exclamation points, and never get taken in by the ends of verse lines on the page as if each ten syllables stop and go as individual isolated thoughts. Shakespeare has given you an engine that will drive you to the end. That engine is fueled by iambic pentameter and defined by the sentences. Shakespeare doesn't resolve his points until such time as he has concluded a sentence and he proceeds to take you on a progression of sentences that run from six lines to three and a half to six and a half to four, then five, seven, and finally resolving over the course of one 12 line sentence. Always ask yourself, what if this is not incidental? What if Shakespeare wants to lead you through a thought process that will bounce you back and forth through a longer grouping, a shorter grouping, longer, shorter, then a little longer, a little longer, and then an extremely long line? Think of it as tension ratcheting up, a pattern that tenses and relaxes, but eventually just tenses, tenses, and tenses until it releases in a climax. Let's break those lines down. One single six-line sentence on the topic of just how much he values honor. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not if men my garments wear, such outward things dwell not in my desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. Three and a half lines countering the logic of wishing for more men to create greater safety. No faith my cause, wish not a man from England. God's peace I would not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share from me for the best hope I have. Six and a half lines throwing caution to the winds and actually offering to let unwilling soldiers go. It's the ultimate counterintuitive defiance, a startling grasp of heroic bravado. And while some productions depict Henry as speaking to his generals, I ask, what if he is making sure that everyone in the army can hear him? Oh, do not wish one more. Rather, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. Four lines setting up the greatness of the occasion of St. Crispin's Day. This feast is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. Five lines envisioning the way in which the day itself will give those soldiers great bragging rights. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, Tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. Seven lines projecting the likelihood that their names will be associated with greatness. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. 
Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. And finally, a twelve-line sentence carrying that fame beyond their own lifetimes on down through the ages. It's the logical conclusion to this math problem in which he weighs rolling the dice in hopes for a fame that rings with immortality and hints at knighthood uh, against a quiet, uneventful, unremembered, perhaps cowardly life. This story shall the good man teach his son, and crisp and crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. This day shall gentle his condition, and gentle in England now a bed shall think themselves a curse they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap was any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. I get it. It's a stupid, simple thing. Checking for the periods, breaking the text up into sentences, but I guarantee you it is not an accident. Shakespeare takes very simple, basic math Fewer men plus greater danger equals greater honor, and elaborates on this math as if it were a series of movements in a great symphony, balancing ideas against each other until he pummels you with a series of lines that lead you up into the stratosphere of imagination and inspiration. Again and again, I hear people extolling about this speech I'm a pacifist, and even I want to go out and fight at the end of this speech. It's a very special combination of music, thought, rhythm, and idea, working through a tiny bit of math that leads you from a state of dejection, cynicism, and hopelessness up into thoughts of glorious victory. It probably won't surprise you to learn that King Henry won this battle. What Shakespeare doesn't stress so much is that the victory may be largely attributable to the French horsemen getting slowed and stuck in the rain-soaked mud of the fields where they were largely sitting ducks for the powerful English archers. This same thesis was expressed by another great English speaker who just happened to be a big fan of Shakespeare. This well-known speaker was absolutely consciously borrowing from Henry V when he said, let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Winston Churchill. If you'd like to see this whole speech from beginning to end, you can catch it as part of Lot O. Shakespeare this Sunday and Monday, April 25th and 26th. 2021 at 8 p.m. Central. If you're watching this video after that date, please swing by timmooneyrep.com for all the latest details of the performance schedule or to book an event for your own school, theater, or conference in person or via the internet. So that's I Finally Get St. Crispin's Day. Next up, I'm planning a wider angle view of the entire play Henry V, questioning just what Shakespeare is trying to tell us about war. Henry V will be my fifth Shakespeare history play explainer and my fourth explainer about the four plays that make up the Henriad, a series that started way back in the play Richard II, which you can find here, or you can cut straight through to the one that first introduces this King Henry from back in the days when he was still known as Prince Hal in Henry IV Part I. If you enjoyed this, please give it a like and subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single thing. If you'd like to support this work, we are a not-for-profit institution, you can find lots of swag, like these books, for instance, and more goodies at timmooneyrep.com or at our Patreon site, patreon.com slash timmooneyrep. Thanks for watching. See you on the stage.